Sorry, I sh that's something I should have figured out. Here we go. So our <laughs> topics today are going to be, first of all, introduction to each of the three funding sources that I, I mentioned. Then we'll talk about implications about the current COVID-19 pandemic and um, how it both creates um, opportunities in some cases and in other cases um, creates obstacles. And we want to we want to be open about both aspects of that. Um, we'll talk about preparing to seek funding, what you have to have in place, how you go about selecting funders because uh, you are going to have enter into a relationship that you want to make sure is a productive relationship. And then we'll ask, uh, and we'll talk also about how these funding sources can work with each other. And then finally, um, ask our, our panelists to share success stories. So we have three wonderful panelists today. Um, and what I'd like each of you to do now is just share um, your own backgrounds. And then in the next question, you can share more about um, the, the specific types of funding um, that you represent. And I'll ask Pat um, to start simply because you're first on the screen here. Yeah, oh, thank you, Carla. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So I've, um, I've got about uh, 40 years of uh, work experience, both in the military and in uh, uh, private sector and working in universities and uh, nonprofit organizations, mostly to help uh, companies start up and existing to uh, uh, compete and win uh, federal research funding to bring their innovations to, to the marketplace. So I'm uh, happy to be here. Yeah. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, can, can you hear me okay there? Yes. Okay. Very good. Uh, Jeff Robbins here. Greetings. Uh, I am an attorney. Yes, you have to have one on one of these panels. So here I am. Uh, and uh, so I've spent uh, many, many, many years at this point uh, working with entrepreneurs who start and grow technology companies and investors who invest in that kind of thing. Uh, so I work with a, a, a lot of local companies on that, on that kind of stuff. Um, I also run an angel investment group in town called Angel Pollination, and we'll talk a bit about that later and uh, just getting involved in a lot of these uh, kinds of events and Minnesota Cup and things of that sort. So uh, very happy to be here uh, uh, at Carla's invitation. Thank you. Jenny? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jenny Hosfeld and um, I work at Think Bank. We're a bank located out of Rochester, Minnesota, a community bank. We also have locations in Egan, Apple Valley, St. Paul, and Edina. Um, my role at the bank is I'm the chief banking officer. I oversee our sales, marketing, operations, and technology. But um, I, the first part of my career in banking, the first 13 years were spent as a business banker. So uh, over half of my career has been helping small businesses get started and or uh, continue their business operations. So a lot of experience with uh, business lending. Thank you. So what I wanted to first do before we ask our questions is just to um, highlight the, the, the broad range of startups that are out there and, and reinforce that different kinds of startups will be appropriate for different kinds of funding. Um, and, and, to, and we hear so much about venture capital, but it actually covers only a tiny portion of new of new companies um, and those are the companies that are going to grow a whole very very fast at as much as 50 percent a year in their in their early years there they have the potential to be billion dollar companies um, but there's a whole lot else out there there is the so-called middle market companies that might grow to be 10 to 100 million dollar companies and then there are also uh, lifestyle companies which are the 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 vast majority of companies. Um, and those are, the, the term lifestyle refers to not that it's a hairdresser or um, something, a company related to the lifestyle of the customers, but that the income of the, of, the, of the company can support the lifestyle of the entrepreneur. So what we are, what we are focusing in here is on this range, understanding that 
the funding and the source of funding for a high potential company that may require millions of dollars may be very different from the funding for a so-called lifestyle company, which would, might require only, only in the thousands. So with that as background, what I'd like to do is, is ask the first question, which is to ask you each to share your respective um, funding sources and, um, and describe how they work, what kinds of ventures get funded, and what typical funding amounts uh, might be. And I will let any, any of the three of you can start with this. Oh, let's do it the same way. Pat, go for it. All right, Jeff. So my uh, claim to fame is working with uh, companies on the federal small business innovation research and small business technology transfer programs. And these two uh, federal programs are our taxpayer investments in companies that have a, a, an innovative idea, concept, or project that has strong commercial uh, potential. And uh, when I think about the, the the slide that Carla just had up on, on the screen. You know, we have companies that are in, in all of those areas and not necessarily in Minnesota, but across the country because this is a federal national program. And, you know, there's a lot of different business models that are, um, are accepted as, as viable commercialization strategies. So we go from the lifestyle company that might be uh, led by a PhD or someone that's very experienced in their field of science and technology and you know, pursuing federal funding to bring uh, an innovation to the marketplace. Or we have you know, some very successful um, companies that have grown up over the years uh, since these programs have been around for decades. Um, probably the, the grandfather of them all is uh, Qualcomm. And Qualcomm had SBIR funding back in the 90s from the National Science Foundation and uh, from DARPA. So when I think about uh, the source of funding, um, it's really there to help de-risk a technology so that it gets to the point where maybe the company needs to bring in other outside investments. And that certainly could include angels and venture capitalists. And it could be for a company that's from one employee all the way up to 500 employees. And so, but predominantly what we see here in Minnesota, and I think it's true mostly across the United States, are companies that are less than uh, 100 employees that get funding through these two programs. So at the end of the day, these, these, this, these, this funding that comes through to companies um, it's a grant or a contract. It's non-dilutive. The money doesn't have to be paid back. The company retains the IP. Um, it's a huge feather in the hat of the small business because these are very uh, competitive programs. And if you're successful as a company in getting these funds, um, that's a, a real testament to your your business and your commercialization opportunity, and of course your your technical uh, team in, inside your company. So I think what's the typical funding amount? Um, generally, there's really no typical funding amount. I think that in general, uh, it's about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars these days, depending upon the federal agencies. And of course, there's 11 that play in the, in the program that have to set aside money uh, for companies to, uh, you know, compete for those dollars. But we, you know, we see some very large uh, awards uh, in the, with the National Institutes of Health. So if you're in the biomedical uh, space, uh, there's some real significant uh, dollars available to support just simply one project over a period of, of five to six years, which could could be up to five to $6 million just for that one project. And, you know, this is what, what I always say that the programs used to be really easy to explain. And it's not so much the case anymore. These federal agencies are doing things very differently based on their, the way they do business. And this is very, um, uh, 
challenging at times because we have companies that can go after funding with two different agencies and the processes are different. So you always have to be thinking about which age agency am I dealing with? How do they do business? Do they offer grants? Do they offer contracts? Do they have broad technology areas? Do they drive the topics? You know, there's so, so there's very, um, there's a lot of idiosyncrasies and nuances associated with these programs. But what's really important for, for all the uh, attendees to uh, recognize is that this isn't funding just to support um, a good idea. There has to be a commercialization opportunity that exists. So oftentimes now with fake, well, it, all the agencies now require as part of the first proposal, uh, a commercialization story, and it has to be credible. It can't just be uh, pie in the sky ideas. They, they want to see customer interviews. They want to see letters to show market validation or, or letters of support that really help uh, tell the story that this is a credible project. It's got commercial uh, opp opportunities. We understand who our customers are. We understand who our competition might be local, I mean, domestically or even internationally. Uh, so there's lots of business aspects to uh, the SBIR and STTR programs, even in the first proposal. And we, if you can bring in outside investment dollars in that first, uh, first application, that's fantastic. It's certainly going to be required in the phase, phase two proposal, the second proposal. So it's science and technology plus business. And I'll stop right there. Do you want to just mention the typical funding amount? Well, it, it very varies by agency, but it's generally about, you know, let's say 225000 for a phase one project, and then uh, a phase two could be uh, $1.5 million or more. And then there's a possibility of getting a, a second tranche of money uh, beyond that uh, phase two, that first phase two. So, so when we start to look at what's the funding stream for this particular project, it isn't just what's at phase one, it's all the way from phase one to phase two to phase two B or whatever that agency calls it. And then of course, then what's the commercialization pathway and, and anywhere along that continuum, there's investor dollars coming in to help support the commercialization activities. Thank you. Yeah. Jeff? All right. Well, greetings uh, uh, again. Um, so uh, I tend to work a lot with companies that are looking for their equity funding. And uh, so I get introduced to a lot of companies at the point in time where they have um, uh, got a prototype of their product uh, or um, at, uh, maybe even their first uh, paying customers and now they're starting to look for funding. So, um, so e equity funding is really a, 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 a fairly simple concept in and of itself. So the difference with the uh, SBIR funding is that uh, it's, as um, Pat describes, non-dilutive. That is, you get the money, you don't have to pay it back, you don't have to give up a stake in the company. Um, that is um, truly a grant uh, you know, kind of situation. Uh, those who invest um, as equity in the companies are expecting to get a return on their investment. And the typical investor, um, whether they are what we would call an angel investor, which tends to be an individual who probably was previously a successful entrepreneur or business person, uh, or still is in the midst of that and has amassed a certain amount of capital and wants to take a percentage of that and invest it into early stage opportunities. Uh, whether it's that kind of investor or a venture investor, I think the typical investor is thinking in their mind that whether it comes to fruition or not, that they're going to invest in the company if, if they believe that their stake that they put into the company in five to eight years may be worth 10 times the amount of money that they put on in. It doesn't mean that they will see a liquidity event in five to eight years, and it doesn't mean that it will be for 10 times their money. But typically, they're convinced in their mind uh, that this is the kind of opportunity that's, uh, that's available for doing that. And so uh, equity funding is essentially where you're giving away a piece of the company. And there are two components to giving away a piece of the company. 
One is, is the economics. So you can give away a share uh, of the economics of the company. And the other is from a control perspective, uh, which is the governance rights. And that is you can give away voting rights uh, with respect uh, to the company. Now, typically, um, in most companies, the voting rights are set up that uh, a majority, uh, those who hold the majority of shares or membership interests, if it's a limited liability company as compared to a corporation, are going to control the decision of, um, as, as the owners, of who is the board, and the board in turn will hire and fire uh, the uh, employees um, and, uh, and the officers, and so it all gets controlled up, uh, ultimately up at the, uh, at, at the ownership level. So the, the types of um, ventures that I see getting, uh, get, getting funded, and when I talked about um, you know, uh, something where a company has, uh, so I tend to play more in the arena, at, as Carlick showed that, uh, that chart, in the, uh, what I'll call the middle market to the venture capital side of the equation. Um, it's, it's harder to find um, um, a series of investors who want to invest in lifestyle businesses. Um, and the reason is, of course, is that if the business is being built uh, to create a, an income stream for the owner, it really isn't as attractive an investment for outside investors because they're looking for a return. And if, uh, and if the owner really isn't looking to build a business that they can sell or to cause it to become publicly traded uh, in terms of the stock, it isn't a very interesting investment for a lot of what I would call the professional investment community uh, here in town. So the types of, uh, of, of ventures that tend to get funded in my world are, are ones where um, people have big ideas and it doesn't matter whether it's in med tech or in data storage and security uh, or uh, you know, whatever arena you want to have, but in generally speaking, you're, you're thinking about an opportunity that for, uh, for thinking long-term in terms of venture capital, um, that is in a market that is probably a billion dollars uh, of an opportunity or, or larger. And for angel investors, they're probably not too interested in something that's much smaller than about a half a billion maybe $300 million in terms, of, uh, in terms of valuation. You can always right size an investment to the size of a, uh, size of a company. Um, but, um, but I see all kinds of different companies getting, uh, getting funded, although obviously as we'll get into discussions um, you know, soon here on COVID-19, um, there are probably some things that are um, going to be harder to get funded right now and um, other things which may be new opportunities that uh, you know, that have come, uh, come about. Now, in terms of what is a typical kind of funding amount in the, uh, uh, in the equity funding space, um, well, I would say that first off, um, that um, typically speaking, you would most likely as a young startup be dealing with individual investors, individual angel investors. And the typical angel investor is probably investing on average somewhere between 10 and $25,000, although, um, uh, and pardon the dogs barking in the background, um, uh, although uh, you can uh, certainly have um, uh, individual investors who will invest uh, you know, a quarter of a million up to a million dollars uh, and even more, depending on you know, uh, the, the situation. But I would say that in many cases, uh, if you're putting together uh, a, a funding package and, uh, I, and oftentimes with the companies that, um, that I will bring uh, to uh, my investor group, Angel Pollination, um, they tend to be looking for a half a million to a million and a half dollars. Um, and that will probably be made up of a, of a group of investors. And there's not probably going to be one who's going to be, um, uh, you know, putting in all the money for that. So um, uh, the, the investment amount, of course, is going to be related very clearly to what it is that the company is trying to achieve, achieve its milestones with that particular investment. So certainly, it, uh, you know, my uh, advice always is that if you're a young company, particularly if you're, uh, if you're pre-revenue, to have the idea that you're going to uh, raise uh, five million or $10 million straight out of the box is not very practical. You need to think about milestones and think about that maybe you need to raise a quarter of a million, a half a million the first time around, and then start building up from, uh, from there. So I think with that, I'll, uh, I'll pause and uh, let uh, Jenny take the uh, next phase of this uh, discussion. Thanks. Great. Right. Thank you, Jeff. Well, as a reminder, uh, what I represent are bank loans. And um, 
from the first chart that Carla had shown, I would say the, the great majority, 99% of what community banks support would be those businesses that are in that lifestyle marketplace. Um, and as a result, our loans um, are typically going to be under a million dollars um, for the startup phase of a business in this entity. That doesn't mean there aren't loans that could be higher than that, but typically at the startup phase and the size business that we're looking at, that's normal. Um, if there's real estate involved, it could get over that amount easily enough. Um, but most startups are looking for financing of inventory equipment, working capital, staffing, those sorts of things. Um, and within the banking world, there's really two forms of loans that we can do. One's what I would call our traditional bank loans, and then another group, which is called SBA financing. Um, and what I'll start with is talking what the two different buckets have in common and then talk about how they're different. Um, because really what we're going to be looking for first and foremost is a solid business plan along with um, financial projections. Um, and, and secondarily, then we're going to be looking at the ownership group and the borrower specifically in terms of what experience um, do they have um, and expertise in the field of business that they're starting and that industry. Uh, it's really challenging if, if you don't come with a solid background or have somebody on your management team that brings in those experiences um, to, uh, to move forward because our experience would say that um, having some expertise in that field is really important. Um, and, and on top of that, we also look at the strength of the management team. You know, there might be one person that's kind of the leader or the owner of the idea and, and leading the charge, but um, they, the management team, even if they're not a part of the loan, they significantly contribute to the success of the, of the startup. So we certainly look at that. And then finally, what kind of differentiates us from what you've already heard about in terms of funding sources is uh, the bank is looking for the ability of the borrower to repay the funds. So we're not looking to give the money away. We're not looking for a return on investment. We're really looking at um, will you be able to repay this uh, dollar amount that we're um, loaning to you to get your business started. And, and so then our primary underwriting is we look at cash flow and we're looking at what are you projecting for cash flow because that's what's going to repay your loan and um, so that's where the strength of those financial projections the how realistic are they um, since they're unproven at this point um, do we believe that the reality is there um, and then secondarily to cash flow is collateral we do rely and, and expect to have some form of collateral securing the loan, and that is meant to be kind of a backup plan should something happen with cash flow where ability to repay becomes a problem, um, then we would have that to lean on as another source of repayment of our, our loan. And third, in terms of structure, we look at guarantees. We do expect that everybody that is an owner in the company, uh, I believe at 20% or greater typically, is a guarantor. Um, and because guarantors are also important, uh, we're looking at the personal financial strength of their, those guarantors. Uh, do they have a solid personal credit history? All those things give a sense of um, you know, the character of our borrowers and their ability to manage finances and, and potentially be uh, supporters of this loan as well. So for both traditional and SBA, those are pretty much the common denominators. And, and where the difference comes in is um, the SBA really can step in and provide additional support to a borrower in the bank's eyes where there might be shortfalls in some of the things I've mentioned. For example, Revenue is certainly and profitability is unproven at the startup phase and and so therefore cash flow we we don't know so what the SBA does is they'll guarantee up to eighty percent of your your loan so that provides a lot of security to the bank to and reduces the bank risk greatly um, and so if the idea is good and the bank thinks wow this really has some real opportunity the SBA can um, really um, fund where maybe some of the gaps are that the borrower brings to the table some other areas that the SBA guarantee provides to the bank is collateral sometimes can be a challenge too depending on the industry that we're financing there might not be something tangible like a, a piece of equipment or real estate um, to tap into from a collateral standpoint and so when collateral is challenging the fact that the SBA is willing to guarantee certainly helps out and then you know there's benefits to the borrower from the SBA side of things too um, the SBA will typically require a small down payment into the project. So 
Um, you know, the bank does expect to have the borrower has something at risk, meaning they've invested some sort of um, equity into the project and um, and the, you know, cash flow sometimes can be tight for startup funding and uh, for the borrowers themselves. And so um, the SBA won't have as uh, large of equity requirements as the bank would. And then finally, the, the SBA will often offer a, a longer amortization period on the loan amount. Um, and again, that helps cash flow, especially for a startup, so that there's a little bit more breathing room as you're getting started to ensure that um, you don't have any issues with uh, not only repaying the loan, but uh, funding the, the business uh, startup pieces that you uh, plan to invest in. So those are really the differences between what a traditional bank loan would be and an SBA loan um, that uh, we offer. And I think I've covered pretty much everything on the, the loan side. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sharana, I see we have uh, several questions. Uh, could you uh, read the, I see we have a couple for Pat and then another one. Could you read those for us? Yeah, so we have a couple questions on SBIR funding. So the first one um, is, do SBIR funds, do they do all kinds of matching, for example, like reimbursement for already spent capital? And then also, um, do the agencies who ad administer the SBIR and STTR funding, do they also take into account the strength of the team as strongly as such like a, a VC firm? So in response to the first question, I mean, there's no matching required uh, for uh, an SBIR or an STTR project. Although I will say that if you have other uh, financial resources that you can bring to bear to support the project, that makes it look uh, more attractive, but it's not, you know, that's not a requirement. Um, and then the other question had to do with, I'm sorry, what was the other question? Yeah, um, so then do the agencies who administer the SBIR funding, do they take into account the strength of the team? Oh, absolutely. So I often, you know, sort of articulate it this way, you know, that, you know, investors are looking for a strong management team. And, and the SBIR and STTR programs are looking for a strong scientific technical team. And then certainly, you know, that's in the first, first proposal, but then in the second proposal, we will want to see that uh, not only that technical team, but then also the business team. And then we do have a couple questions on loans. And then, so apparently they're taught that the debt equity ratio for funding is four to one. So then could a grant be considered in place of equity to apply for a bank loan? My experience would say yes and no. Um, the piece about equity and the borrower actually having some cash into it means they've really, they've invested something personally now that's on the line. And that's really important because not only psychologically, you know, have, have they committed, but it shows to the bank that they're willing to also put something at risk. So um, we typically like to see some personal investment in addition to any type of grant um, money that they might receive. And then also, would anyone um, pursue a traditional bank loan instead of an SBA loan? There are times where you can make that work. Uh, again, it really comes down to um, the strength of the, the collateral and um, equity into the project. So if there's substantial equity invested in, um, that could be a, a, a way for the bank to say, you know, we don't think we need the SBA. But I would say nine times ten out of ten, you're, the banks are most likely going to lean on that SBA to be additional support from the get-go. So then are SBA interest rates higher than traditional interest rates? They might be slightly higher, but not considerably. I still think and, and feel that it's a, a really strong avenue um, and the benefits in addition to the, the rates being reasonable, um, you really benefit from being able to reserve some of your cash because um, it's always nice to have a little bit of cash in the bank, too, in case something unexpected comes up in the startup phases um, that, you know, the bank might not be able to add, add to the loan to support um, and or uh, the amortization stretch that you get with the SBA that you might not get with a bank. Again, just it really helps provide some more um, support around your cash flow that may be unforeseen in, as you're getting started. 
And then lastly, we just have a general question. Um, what funding rate would you recommend for a pre-revenue, pre-FDA approved medical device company? Oh, maybe I'll grab that one. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, that, that would be smack dab down the middle of what equity funding is, uh, it is all about. And so um, I, I would say that <clears throat> there are innumerable number of examples of early stage pre-revenue, pre-FDA medical device companies here in town that have been funded through the angel investment community. And, uh, you know, uh, often the first round of funding is not actually equity, but it's something called a convertible note, which is basically a promissory note that accrues some interest rate on it that's never intended to be paid back but that will automatically convert into equity of the company at a future time when the company is doing a bigger round of funding and can actually come to terms with investors and what the company's value really is. And at that time, that convertible note and the accrued interest on it will convert into the same form of equity instrument that the next round investors are investing into, but the folks who put in their money earlier get some sort of discount, typically a 15 to 25% discount um, on the pricing uh, going into that, uh, that particular round. So we see an awful lot of stuff um, on the equity funding front for uh, pre-revenue, uh, you know, pre-FDA medical device companies. And of course, Pat will see that kind of stuff as well too in SBIR. Uh, 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 that kinds of grants. And of course, I think she's going to jump in and tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah. You're absolutely right, Jeff. Yeah, that's, that's the ideal sort of candidate uh, for uh, especially NIH, uh, National Institutes of Health, SBIR, STTR funding is that pre-revenue, pre-FDA. Um, you know, one thing that, you know, with NIH these days, you know, they're supporting animal studies, IDEs, uh, INDs, um, you know, clinical trials. So there's, you know, the, the, the funding is there. And, um, you know, I really, you know, encourage a lot of folks to, you know, seriously look at it. And we're here to help you navigate through that process. And, um, you know, we, we have a lot of experience with it. And, and, you know, we have consultants that can, you know, provide ad hoc services to support, um, support those companies. And it's free. Your tax dollars have paid for, for these uh, programs to um, help you navigate through those programs. Sharona, do you want to ask the last question? And then yeah. we'll look at the next question. Next. Perfect. And then the last one is, could you approach angel investors asking for convertible notes, or do they determine how to invest in a pre-revenue company? And then like, what's the time, her, timeline for that as well? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that one. Um, uh, what I would say is, is that, yes, there's nothing wrong at all about um, whether it's a convertible note or the form of equity instrument or whatever it is um, for you as an entrepreneur to have a one-page term sheet that says, here's what we propose or to have an actual form of document. Um, uh, you, you obviously need somebody to step up and say, I'll invest on that particular basis or to negotiate with you over what the terms are. And then once you have your first investor or first significant group of investors, now you've got a set of terms that you keep rolling out to additional investors that you meet, essentially saying, well, you know, the terms are already set by the prior investors. And so you kind of, uh, you know, hope that you can snowball onto um, the first person who was uh, able to negotiate with you and come up with uh, an arrangement that works well. From a timing perspective, I would tell you that uh, I'd, I'd say that um, uh, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs find that it takes much longer to raise money than they thought. Um, it's a, uh, it takes up 100% of your time and then you have to, of course, build a business on top of that. Um, and so um, it's not uh, at all atypical for it to take, uh, you know, three to six months uh, to do a, a round of funding. Um, and so oftentimes it's good to think about if the money comes in in stages, how will I, will I deploy it along the way? Because I may not get it all in a, in a single lump sum kind of arrangement. Okay. Thank you. So let's go to another topic, if I can successfully move forward here. And that's the implications for our current situation with COVID-19. 
um, about uh, for pre-launch entrepreneurs, is it feasible for them to seek funding and in what circumstances? And then uh, we won't go into detail on post-launch entrepreneurs, um, but at least to understand where they can go for more information on support for small businesses. So I'll uh, start, you know, since, um, since the, the huge uh, stimulus package that was passed by Congress and signed into law, by the president, of course, there's a lot of funding opportunities, um, the loan programs for small businesses. Um, right now, there's not much in, in the sense of uh, funding for startups and uh, that might change with some legislation that's, uh, I, you know, sort of making its way through Congress through another, another package deal. And, uh, and I, I know enough about it to be dangerous, but you know, I know that it's being worked on. But in the world of federal R&D, um, so there are a lot of funding opportunities that are slowly making its way from the agencies out into the, to the business community, the research community at our, at our universities. And um, I try to capture it all and I actually, you know, on our MNSBIR uh, news uh, link, you know, we try to list out all the funding opportunities that have been come out in the last, you know, three, four weeks. But uh, every day or it seems like every week there's something that's coming out. So what I would say to a pre-launch, post-launch entrepreneur, if you've got um, a technology that you know, can, has a fit with, uh, uh, within the COVID-19 environment. And I think outside the box, don't, you know, keep a, a kind of a tunnel vision on this, is to, to reach out uh, to me or maybe to others, maybe at the university that you might be working with, et cetera, but to really get a handle on what are the opportunities that make sense for my business. And, you know, these opportunities, uh, they're very broad and, and you just have to do some of the homework to make sure that it's a good fit for your business and for your, your you know, and these, these, these opportunities take time. So I think some of the agencies are really trying to ramp up very quickly and, and make awards to existing grantees or contractors through, you know, vehicles that they have, but then they're going to make new awards to other companies that have some really innovative technology to address uh, this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, so I, you know, you, you could, you know, take the time to look at grants.gov, which is a listing of all the uh, solicitations that the agencies release. And you can simply just put in COVID-19 and, and basically look what pops up. Or you can look at, um, there's a database called beta at sam.gov, which lists all the contracting agencies that have uh, COVID-19 uh, funding opportunities. You can imagine that these agencies are really trying to figure out how to get the money into the hands of the companies or the organizations that can actually do uh, good work with that and um, you just you know have to be patient with them. I know that uh, in the recent science magazine that the National Institutes of Health received a, a $945 million bump in their budget. Um, some of that money is going to trickle down into the SBIR and SCTR programs and we're starting to see funding opportunity announcements come out um, from NIH with, you know, this focus on COVID-19. Uh, the National Science Foundation ended up with about maybe $250 million in funding uh, to help support this uh, COVID-19 um, effort. So I, you know, the message is, 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 you know, try to stay on top of it. You know, you can, you know, link to our page and, and you know, look at it on a weekly basis. And I try to update it as, as much as I can, but there's, uh, obviously a, a significant amount of um, uh, information that's out there. And I think sometimes just trying to get a handle on it is really hard to do, but you know, you can start with us and then we can help, help direct you to the sources that might be most relevant to your project and your opportunity. Pat, in the meantime, are, are the regular SBIR deadlines still in effect? 
Uh, yes and no. Um, so because of COVID-19, we've seen some uh, dead agency deadlines shift. Uh, so the National Institutes of Health, which normally has an April uh, uh, 5th deadline, actually is now shifted to, to May 1st to allow those companies that were likely, you know, interacting or collaborating with a research institution and, you know, they have, they have to get things through their system in order to add to their, their application. So that deadline changed. NASA changed its deadline. Um, so, I mean, we, you know, we have to stay fluid and agile as, as things continue to evolve. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, you're um, welcome. I also have a, a message from, from Neela Mulgard from Launch Minnesota reminding us that DEED has a COVID-19 webpage um, for small businesses and startups that includes information about emergency funding. Um, why, don't I, why don't I move over to Jenny to talk about this and then we'll, and then we'll go to, to Jeff. Great. So the question about is it feasible right now with COVID, it certainly has um, changed the world greatly. Um, and, and is it tougher to get a bank loan right now than it was pre-COVID? Probably yes. Um, and, and primarily due to the economic uncertainty and, and the fact that so many businesses and industries have been impacted by the stay-at-home orders. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. Certainly this is a time I think of innovation and there's certainly different needs that are arising. I know that as a bank, we're already starting to operate and do things differently. So I think it's a real opportunity for entrepreneurs out there to, to figure out how the world might change because of all of this and how we do business. Um, and so while it might be tougher, I, I never wanna say never that you couldn't, um, but it, it probably is more challenging. Um, and uh, regarding the post-launch uh, and where they can go, as Neela mentioned, Deed's a great resource. Also, if you Google um, Small Business Development Center or SBDC, um, those are also agencies that help, I don't believe, for any cost uh, with business planning, and they're very well educated on all the SBA governmental loan programs, too, and certainly can help. Um, and don't be shy to call your local bank, either. They're happy to talk to you and, and guide you to um, resources in your community as well. Jeff? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Well, so <clears throat> the issue for, uh, for entrepreneurs entrepreneurs seeking equity funding really fits in two categories. Number one, there's the issue of whether or not we're entering a recession and how does that impact um, uh, the folks who typically would be investing in early stage opportunities, the angel investors. And then number two, what's the nature of the types of things that, that people would be interested in investing into. So I, uh, I mentioned earlier that I run an angel investment group called Angel Pollination. We've met uh, since 2011, uh, four times a year. Um, and um, I usually have 30 or 40 local investors who attend, uh, attend the events and we, we profile three different uh, new companies uh, in Minnesota each, uh, each time round and, and, and the speaker of interest. So I, I went to my database of, uh, uh, of investors and I, uh, and I did a, a survey of them to inquire what the interest level would be uh, as to investing um, in, in this time. And uh, to my surprise, I received a very high uh, indication that, uh, that the group definitely wants to uh, see new opportunities and definitely envisions that they would continue to be investing into opportunities. So um, that would be consistent with the, with the concept that, um, that investors have to invest for the long term anyway. So no investor can invest in something today and expect that they're going to get a return on it in the next few months anyway. It's several years down the way. So it's really an issue uh, around whether or not the idea is something that they think has legs for, uh, for a long term kind of basis in terms of what it is. So uh, people continue to indicate uh, interest in uh, in, in medical device things and in data storage and in all kinds of different areas. There was certainly a group uh, who said they would be interested in things that have some specific reference to, to working at home or otherwise um, impacting, um, you know, how you uh, work outside the, uh, uh, outside the office in any sort of sense. The other side of the equation, of course, is, is uh, how, how does the re, um, it, do we have a recession? Will it recover quickly? How will that Im impact things? Um, I can tell you, having been through uh, the crash in 1987, 
Um, so that gives you an idea how old I am at this juncture now. And, um, uh, and of course, through the Great Recession and through the dot-com crash um, uh, at the end, uh, at the turn of the century, um, what I would say is, is that um, the, the length of time of a recession does impact things. So the worst of the bunch was, um, was in 2008. We really saw that uh, the local investment community really truly did um, you know, pull in uh, their horns and uh, were not there prodding away looking for interesting new opportunities. And it was really hard to get people to invest for a good number of years uh, in there. Certainly, companies uh, came out of the uh, out of the Great Recession, and uh, uh, and some of those companies are now the ones that are starting to build significant businesses at this point in time. So it's a you know it's a great time in the middle of a recession to work on uh, building a company, but it is harder to raise uh, you know to, to raise funding. And and part of that, of course, is is that if you think about it, the typical investor is investing not the money they need to live on, but their uh, their investable capital. And if their investable capital was in the market or some other place um, and they liquidate as they like to uh, invest into a new early stage opportunity, the value of their own portfolios have gone down and that will impact you know, their, their interest level on investing. The other thing is, of course, is, is that at the moment, it's hard for us all to get together and meet. Um, so, you know, a lot of investors um, are used to being able to uh, see a live uh, presentation by uh, an entrepreneur and then be able to follow up uh, literally by kicking the tires, going to see the technology working uh, you know, at hand, going to meet other people on the team, et cetera, et cetera. And now we have to do that using technology like this, like Zoom or, or whatever, which is why, of course, their stock price has gone up so significantly um, in, in, this, uh, in this opportunity. So we don't yet know exactly how investors are going to react uh, you know, to, to things. I think what it does mean is that increasingly it becomes more important uh, for our angel investment groups in town because it brings together investors. This is one of the problems in a, uh, you know, if, if you have to go looking for investors one off uh, and uh, find them and then you can't even get together for a cup of coffee to, uh, to meet with them, it's really tough. But it's easier if you can get picked as a company that's going to present in front of a group, uh, and then the group itself will start driving the process uh, for for investment. Um, so that's kind of my thoughts around that. Um, and and on the uh, last front, of course, you got lots of good information from our, our other two presenters. I'll just tell you that uh, our own website, Avise and Legal A as in uh, Alpha, v, v as in Victor, uh, I S E N Avise and Legal.com. Uh, has a uh, link as well too to all of our COVID-19 uh, you know, resources, and there's a lots of good information there and uh, uh, seminars that we've uh, that we've done, and uh, links to a lot of other uh, information. And it may be duplicative of things you're seeing elsewhere, and it may add to your base of information about understanding government programs that are available. So, um, back to you, Carol. Thank you, Jenny. Was there anything else you wanted to add? You know, the only thing I didn't mention um, is uh, the the pay, Paycheck Protection Program for the post-launch. And not to go into all those details, but uh, if there is anybody in the audience that has been in business, um, certainly that's a program right now for COVID support. And uh, many, if many community banks, large banks, all banks of all sizes right now are supporting that. So um, I highly encourage people to reach out if they're if they're looking for some help right now. Uh, Sharada, do you want to read this one question that came in for Jenny? Yeah, um, it's a question for Jenny. Do you have any thoughts or wisdom on personal loans versus SBA business loans? That's a, a good question. Um, and it may be a little bit of a legal question too. So I'll defer on the legalities because I'm not an attorney. So maybe Jeff can answer that piece. But um, it really comes down to business structure and if you've got an LLC or if you're a sole proprietor or what it may be in that regard. Um, and, and it may be a combination um, where the bank would look at uh, lending against some personal assets to help get that equity contribution I mentioned earlier into the, the business loan. Um, so it might be a combination of most often what I see is a home equity loan to help support um, some equity, or the home equity is even used to help support the collateral of the business loan. So it, it often can be a combination of both. Um, 
but whether or not you just solely went personal or business, I think I'll turn that over to Jeff from the, the legal side of it. Well, I, I won't say too much about the legal side of it other than to say um, that if you are organized um, as a pastor entity like a, a, an S corporation, an LLC, there may be some advantage to um, debt coming in personally and then the funds being uh, either lent or contributed into the company uh, Leo, uh, in the sense that it creates a basis against which uh, to the extent that the company in the early years creates losses that can pass back on to your personal tax returns uh, as an owner. But that only really is of value if you, for example, have a spouse who's making a bunch of money uh, you know, and you have a place to offset that against. If you're, if you're all in as an entrepreneur, um, that may not uh, have a, a lot of value to you. I, I, would, I would generally say that um, the issue of whether or not you're borrowing the money personally or getting it through the business is probably more a question of what structure the lending institution you're working with will allow you to get the money for as, a, uh, as an early stage entrepreneur. And that's probably going to drive things more than whether or not one is more okay. tax efficient or otherwise. Thank hey, you. Jeff, Jeff, I had a quick question for you. This is John Stavik, just in terms of having you know, been through a couple of these cycles as well and how the, the investors you know, can get worn out over time and liquidity obviously is, is very powerful right now. For businesses that have a good story, would you agree that you know, now is a good time to be out raising money? I mean, if yeah, I think, I think it is because I think that you've got a lot of, uh, a lot of people who are investors um, uh, frankly may have a little bit more time on their hands right now and therefore um, you know that's one of the one of the things that's hard for investors is to be able to find the time to pay attention to listen to a story do the due diligence work around it and they probably have a little bit more ability to do that right uh, uh, right now and I think that a lot of investors continue to think that um, this artificially created recession because of the uh, because of the virus will have a faster return to normalcy uh, on the on the back back end and if so um, it will um, further I think uh, the the concept that investors don't want to let go of the idea of paying attention to things so I'm seeing gopher angels is continuing to uh, uh, to move forward with deals. I just reviewed a term sheet for, uh, for one of their deals that investors are, uh, are lining up to, uh, to, to get into. Um, so I, I, I do believe that um, uh, there's, you know, your, your only limitation right now is figuring out how to connect with people. Not, and that was always a problem before anyway. It's just a new way of having to figure that out right now. But I guess what I'm seeing, particularly in some, you know, whether it's digital health or food, or I know the Atlant Ventures students had a, you know, cleaning products company that did a, a very quick fundraise just to get additional capital. If there's a good story to tell, I would think investors are still receptive. Yes, I would agree with you, Joe. Okay. So that you guys are leading us into the next question, which is, um, it may be that you can be seeking funding now. It may be that you might have to wait a while, but now is a good time to get ready for that. And um, for each of, each of the three of you, what you need to have in place is a little bit different. And so why don't we go back to Pat and talk about um, what, what, what a, a company needs to do to be ready to seek funding and what they should have in place for, uh, for innovation grants. <clears throat> so I start with um, the premise that you're uh, obviously trying to commercialize something and, and as a startup or even an existing small business, it's uh, what, uh, what kind of financing requirements, funding requirements are going to be required in order to take that concept all the way to commercialization. And to have that uh, sort of laid out in, um, at the very beginning, even before you, uh, you know, start putting pen to paper with respect to writing a, a proposal to a federal agency for funding. The reality is in these days that um, you're gonna have to tell that story. In um, many of the agency uh, phase one proposals, 
they will want to know uh, what the revenue model is, is, you know, what that looks like, what the financing strategy is going to be, et cetera. So if you can have that information um, already figured out and, and agreed upon by yourself, your board, uh, et cetera, you know, you're going to be in such a better shape um, uh, in going after federal SBIR and STTR funding. And then in phase two, which is the, the next uh, phase, this, this will be very important uh, because it's very much a part of the decision-making process that the agency goes through before they make that, that award. And when we're talking about millions of dollars in, uh, that's you know, potentially uh, uh, available for that small business for that, that phase, I mean, they get very serious about the commercialization. So why, why are they so focused on this? So in 2000, when the programs were reauthorized by Congress, they put a lot of language in the legislation that, that really put a lot of uh, pressure on the agencies to really start looking at um, helping these companies transition and commercialize their technology. Well, this has just grown over the years. And um, you know, we see it uh, with the National Science Foundation with the creation of the i -Corps program, which of course the University of Minnesota is a, an i -Corps site. Um, you know, the i -Corps nodes all across the country. So companies that have to go through the lean startup um, and the i -Corps curriculum, the same thing happens on the SBIR and ST, STTR side of the house as well. So we, we see this, this huge push, this whole focus on commercialization and, you know, when uh, Carla would probably agree to this, I mean, this actually came out of the White House uh, during the Obama administration, where there was this focus on the lab to marketplace. And not only did they say, you know, we need this national i -Corps program, but we also need to help support these SBIR and SCTR companies be able to commercialize their technology. So there's like this, I, I start with the premise, you know, you sort of have the end in mind as you start down this path of, of pursuing SBIR, STTR funding. And there's no limit to the amount of uh, awards or dollars a small business can receive. And we have some very successful small businesses in Minnesota that have won millions of dollars of funding and that have commercialized. That's, that's the big, uh, big focus is, you know, what have you done with that? Has it resulted in anything? Is there a return on investment for the taxpayer? You know, we're not in the business of, of, of funding, uh, you know, uh, pet projects or science projects that don't have a, uh, an impact in the future. So I, my, my mindset is you got to start with the end in mind and, and, uh, and then use SBIR and SCTR funding to help help leverage your other investment dollars to bring that innovation to, to the marketplace. Thanks. Jenny, you started to allude to this uh, back when you were talking about loans. Um, mm -hmm. Can you uh, expand a little bit about what a venture should have in place and what they need to get ready, do to get ready? Yeah, what I, what I mentioned earlier was certainly a, a comprehensive business plan that explains, you know, what is your business model, what's your product, how do you plan to generate revenues, who's your target market, um, and um, uh, the, greatly just explains what your vision is for your business. Um, combined with, you know, a set of financial projections that go out three to five years so that there's some kind of um, roadmap that shows us, okay, how does your business plan then translate into a revenue and, and cash flow stream um, are certainly going to be very important pieces for us to evaluate the, the loan. Um, and then the third piece that I've written down here is, you know, legal work. So how is your business going to be formed? Is it going to be an LLC? Is it an S Corp? Is it going to be a C Corp, um, sole proprietor? Uh, get your bylaws, your organizational documents put in place, and uh, your federal um, EIN number. Uh, those are all kind of uh, ticky-tacky things that uh, the bank's going to need in order to, to prove your uh, a legal working um, business and uh, helps us on our end with the, the pieces that we have to go through for um, our, our administrative duties. Thank you. And Jeff? 
Indeed, yes. Well, oh my goodness. Um, well, let's let's start at the beginning. So, if you have a business that has a uh, a technology that is potentially intellectually protectable, um, you should start with the question of whether or not you need to file a provisional patent to protect things before you go off and start talking to investors. Now, I'm not a patent guy. Uh, I can certainly uh, you know introduce you to uh, to great folks who do that kind of work, but you know realize that in today's world. Um, Filing for a patent is a race to the patent office. Uh, so the rules changed in the United States a few years ago. It used to be that the first to invent, even if they were the later one to file for a patent, if you could demonstrate you're the first to invent something, you would get, get it protected. Now it's an issue of who files for a patent first. So it becomes important to consider that uh, in your process um, if you're gonna go out and talk with investors. Investors in, in early stage companies indeed are interested in uh, in what form does your company take um, from a legal uh, perspective. So indeed, the most common things are either a limited liability company or a, uh, or a corporation. Uh, most typically, um, uh, I, what I tend to tell most uh, companies that walk in the door having already formed a company, that um, you stick with whatever it is you have until an investor tells you to do something differently. Um, what you will tend to see over time is that professional investors, uh, either uh, angel investors who are part of uh, investment groups uh, or um, venture capital uh, groups are going to insist that the company be organized as a corporation that is taxed uh, on its own income as a C corporation. Um, and um, there's a variety of reasons for that that are beyond the scope of I, what I think we need to talk about uh, you know, uh, for today's purpose. But you obviously need an entity of some sort to be the basis upon which that people are going to invest into. Excuse me, my dear dog, would you stop barking? <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm right on cue. Um, and um, um, so then um, uh, in reality, with an early stage company, people are investing you know, for two reasons. Uh, one is, is they think you got a really interesting idea in a big space. So you have to be prepared to talk about um, uh, you know, the market opportunity and have done some research around that. And then um, they're going to be interested in you as the management team, because in an early company where there's no revenue, um, they're going to be looking to the management team. And if you don't have experience in building a business, then what you want to do is, is do a good job of bringing in advisors, both either formally as part of your board of directors or your board of governors, depending on whether it's a corporation or an LLC, uh, or informally uh, advisors, including if you're in the medical device uh, you know, industry, to get a, uh, an advisory group of practitioners who practice in the area in which you're developing a product for, who strongly believe in what it is that, uh, that you're doing, because investors will, uh, will look at the totality of your management team and maybe not necessarily just at you and the holes that you may have in your own skill set. And so therefore you have an opportunity to plug those, uh, those holes by, uh, you know, by bringing together other folks. Um, you will want to have the ability to tell your story. Um, uh, in days gone by, um, we used to have investment banks who would go tell the story to investors and they, they would require that you prepare a confidential private placement memorandum, a big thick thing that looks like a prospectus for a public stock offering. The good news is we're kind of past that. And most typically what I find that um, young companies use for raising uh, you know, capital is a combination of a one page executive summary, um, a PowerPoint presentation, um, that um, they should be able to walk through in, uh, in eight to 12 minutes, um, and uh, a subscription agreement, which is basically the document upon which uh, I say, I'm, I'm now prepared to invest money into the company. Um, and that subscription agreement, if it does a nice job, may also include uh, pages, unfortunately pages, uh, of explanations of reasons why investors should not give you their money. It's the risk factor disclosure. And that is, really um, your own personal protection from a, in, uh, you think of it almost as insurance by telling investors, here are all the reasons why you should not consider investing into our company. And if they do so, you can sleep at night 
that they aren't going to be uh, waking up the next day and saying, hey, I want my money back because you didn't tell me that I could lose it because of X, Y, or Z. You've already thought of that and given them all the reasons why they shouldn't have given you the money, but they did. So I think those are uh, some of the basic pieces that you probably have to have in place to have a successful uh, equity from fundraising. Carla, back to you. Thank you. So I, uh, John Stavig uh, just posted on the chat um, the link to the Minnesota Cup, uh, which uh, the deadline for um, participate for submitting uh, your your uh, application is this Friday, and that becomes another vehicle for putting a lot of the stuff that our panelists have talked about, actually putting that in place and also getting some exposure uh, to potential investors. Uh, Sharada, do you want to read the questions before we move on to the next topic? Yeah, so the first question is, could a small business get SBIR, SBIR loans from multiple agencies or does one award preclude another award? <clears throat> well, first of all, they're not loans. Uh, these are grants or contracts, so you don't have to pay the money back. And yes, we have companies that get uh, awards, uh, multiple awards from different agencies. It's, it's perfectly acceptable. And then how exhaustive is the reporting for SBIR funding? Well, that depends upon the agency. First of all, um, let's hope you get to the point where you're reporting on something because that means you've had an award. Uh, which is a, a big deal. Uh, you know, each agency does things a little differently. So, uh, you know, just think about what, what you would want to have in place if you were um, uh, managing the taxpayer's money. So, you know, we have, uh, uh, you know, there's financial uh, reporting requirements with federal grants or contracts and, and also uh, reporting on uh, the results of the research effort. And uh, all, the, all that information is used to, um, you know, kind of make a big uh, decision about are you gonna, uh, you're a good steward of the taxpayer's money. And if you prove yourself as being a, a good steward, then that really lends you for more awards in the future, uh, you know, contingent on the scientific and technical uh, research that's being proposed. But you know, like the University of Minnesota, like Mayo Clinic, or any other uh, entity that gets, you know, small businesses that get federal funding, uh, yeah, they have to have processes and systems and reporting requirements in place to meet those requirements as you know as set forth by those agencies. And then lastly, we have if a startup does form an advisory group and bring members to the board, can you tell us how these different people are compensated or what the general expectation is? Sure, that, that sounds like one for me. Um, so I would generally say that your members of the board who have actual uh, legal exposure um, to uh, you know, act in the best interest of the business and they act as, uh, in some manner of speaking, as fiduciaries for the shareholders, um, you tend to compensate your directors more than you would uh, an advisory member. Now, the important thing to understand is in, in an early stage company, you don't have the cash to pay folks to uh, be board members uh, or to be on committees, and you don't have cash to pay uh, advisors. So we're talking about uh, you know, equity stakes in the company. And so uh, I, would, I would generally say that you may see that uh, an equity stake for an advisor might be a quarter, uh, to, uh, a quarter to a half a percent of equity that vests over a few years of, of participation. And you might see that the equity for a board member uh, is more like uh, three quarters of a point to a quarter and a, 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 a one and a quarter point uh, to one and a half point somewhere in that uh, in that category. Things are all over the place, uh, obviously. The earlier you, you are, probably the bigger the stake you, you may give somebody who's important to be a board. Um, and um, you know, the farther you are down the path that you invite somebody on, um, you have more value to the company and therefore you probably are going to give away less equity at that particular point in time. Thank you. Um, so our, our friends at Red Wing Ignite are reminding us uh, that they have a, uh, a venture competition that feeds into the Minnesota Cup. Um, those of you who are trying to do um, something that posts to the entire group, uh, this webinar is not set up that way. 
um, because we're in the age of also so-called Zoom bombing. Um, so um, <laughs> the only people that can actually post are, are, uh, are the panelists and the co-hosts. Um, but I would encourage people that are in, in the region for, for Red Wing Ignite to look at their website to learn more about that. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to quickly address this topic about selecting funders, and then we're going to skip over to uh, sharing success stories as, as well. Well, I can go first this time. Um, you know, I really believe in partnerships and, and that's how the bank looks at it when they're, they're helping business owners with their business. And um, first and foremost, any good banker is going to want to do what they can do to support you and help you be successful. Um, of course, the bank wants to get repaid and uh, is a priority, of course, but it isn't the only priority and it doesn't come above and beyond really being um, seen by the customer, by the borrower as a true partner in their business. And uh, there's nothing more fun as a banker to see a business get started and then see it really flourish and, and do really well and grow into what the original vision of the owner was. So um, I really think looking at a bank, it's really, do you feel like the person you're working with at the bank is trustworthy, is somebody that's going to listen to you, um, challenge you too, um, and uh, bring forth ideas and challenge some of your ideas and thinking, um, sometimes tell you what you don't want to hear. Um, that's sometimes hard to have to hear, but it's really important for your long-term success. Doesn't mean the banker's always right, but I think it's a good perspective to have. Um, and uh, so I, I really think it comes down to is, is that person sitting across the table from you, somebody you feel like you can connect with and lean on um, in good times and in, in tougher times. Thank you. Uh, Jeff? Sure thing. So um, uh, I'll, I'll focus on the, uh, uh, of course, on the issue of how do, you, how do you pick a specific kind of investor. So the most important thing is, is to understand who you're talking to. You know, if you're, if you're talking to an investor who you've determined historically invests in medical device companies to talk to them about investing in a restaurant uh, you know, kind of deal, probably doesn't make a lot of sense unless there's some personal connection or you happen to know they like that kind of food or it's in their neighborhood or something of that, that particular sort. We tend to find that investors invest in things that they understand. Um, they will certainly uh, invest in a diversified portfolio of early stage companies, particularly if they're investing through an angel investment group. But for the most part, I find that people tend to return, if they are food and beverage people, they are food and beverage people. If they are device people, they are device people. If they're tech folks, they're generally tech folks uh, you know, uh, along the way. And, and there isn't a lot of crossover uh, between uh, between investors. So do your homework um, when you're planning to reach out to a, an investor. And that goes for whether it's a angel investor or whether it's a venture firm. Venture firms are the same way. They're going to look, a venture firm will typically look at a thousand different opportunities to invest in one of them. So you, it really is catching lightning in a, in, in a bottle. But, you know, I'll, gi I'll give you an, an, an example of kind of matching things on up. So um, I, I worked with an entrepreneur uh, who was an undergraduate at the Gustavus uh, Adolphus uh, College, um, and he presented uh, his, uh, his concept to a panel of uh, investors who were alumni of Gustavus Adolphus. Um, one of them introduced them uh, to me, and another one of the panelists ended up investing uh, in the company because he wanted to support um, you know, alumni of Gustavus. So there, you're looking for a reason for connection. You can look for all kinds of different reasons, but don't forget that from a subject matter perspective, that's probably the most critical one. Thank you. And, and Pat, in terms of uh, federal agencies? Well, I, you know, like investors, you want to make sure it's a, a good fit. And, um, you know, when I, when I talk to folks about the different agencies and what their research interests are and, how, how you need to strategize with um, a granting agency versus a contracting agency. It's really doing the homework of um, really, you know, figuring out where does, where do I fit and, and do they, you know, value the kind of research or the uh, commercialization effort that I have in front of me. 
and you know it's, uh, for many agencies you can actually you know talk to the people inside the agencies about your proposed project and making sure that it's a, a good fit because it's going to be hopefully a long-term relationship with them and that you will continue to uh, have other ideas other projects that you'd like to seek funding for so you it's it's a long-term relationship that you're building with these these agencies and and when there's 11 agencies and they are all doing something a little different but yet they have overlap so when we have a medical device you know kind of a company um, and I just had this conversation today with a, an entrepreneur is that you know when you're thinking about like the National Science Foundation very much engineering focused so split up the project so that it's the engineering piece of the project fits with NSF and then the clinical piece uh, which, you know, they're, they're collaborating with Mayo Clinic on this project. I said, now you can propose that to the National Institutes of Health. There's no budgetary or scientific overlap. Um, you're leveraging both agencies to help fund this, this project that you have, this product development effort. And, uh, you know, that's the strategy that I uh, try to communicate all the time with, uh, with our entrepreneurs to make sure that, you know, they're going down the best path possible uh, for their project. And our last question, share a success story. Well, well I'll, 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 uh, I'll go ahead, Pat. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. <laughs> So I, after having spent, um, oh, 20, 27 years uh, working with uh, startup and existing companies in the SBIR and SCTR programs, I have a lot of success stories uh, under my belt. And, and I can say that there are a number of companies that would not have gotten through the process. And it isn't just about the proposal. I mean, yes, that's a very big part of it, but there's so much more to the process of actually getting to the winner's circle and then continuing uh, to compete and win funding. And, and it really brings me a lot of joy and a lot of professional um, satisfaction that I've had um, uh, a front row seat to entrepreneurs uh, realizing the American dream and especially for scientists or engineers that um, you know that this is a prime prime uh, program for them and uh, you know it's just very heartwarming probably the most impactful uh, project that I had was actually when I was in Wisconsin and it was with a company that was based in Rice Lake Wisconsin so if anybody knows their geography of Wisconsin. This is north of Highway 8, and there's not a lot above uh, Highway 8 other than a lot of uh, resorts and lakes and so forth. Well, this company um, had been in business for 40, uh, 30 years, and uh, they you know, knew how to take advanced biomedical instruments and, and put them on trucks and then take the trucks around to different hospitals and clinics so that patients wouldn't have to try, you know, drive hundreds of miles in order to have a procedure done. So they really knew how to do that. Well, there were two clinicians down at, um, in, one was at Medical College of Wisconsin, another one was at um, uh, uh, UW-Madison in the medical physics lab, and they were pioneering work in this uh, new area of uh, fetal monitoring. And, but they had this stationary system down at UW-Madison, and they really wanted to take this system and make it mobile. So we had this collaborative uh, project with the, the company in Rice Lake, the clinician, the researcher, um, and then there were three industrial partners. I mean, and we got funding through NIH. It took us a couple of times, but we got funding through NIH and 3.3 million to support that project. This, this is uh, really an important um, story because this is where I believe, and, and this is why Launch Minnesota is so important to Minnesota's economy, is that there are good ideas and good projects all across the state. But for those companies to get connected to the resources and the capabilities that can support them is really vital to their success. And SBIR and SCTR can be a part of that, um, that, the, that success. But again, you know, we have, you know, 
the work that the you know, Carlson School is doing with um, Minnesota Builder Venture Builders uh, effort, which I think is fantastic, and you know the whole ecosystem to support innovation and commercialization of technology. And so that's my big success story. And then, but I have many others too. <laughs> yeah, I'm not asking you to choose your favorite child, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, for Jenny, would you each like to share something? Sure, I'll go ahead. Um, you know, really, my, my story is somebody that was in the food industry and retail, and he and his spouse came with the background, um, and but had never been out on their own. And so their expertise lied in the business itself. They did not have the, the legal, the banking, or the accounting experience. And so what I saw right from the get-go is they utilized all the resources they could on the front end to help support with business planning, financial projections through the Small Business Development Center in our area. So they were able to utilize free resources, come to the bank with a really good plan. We did end up partnering with the SBA um, to get support for their loans. They had personal cash into the project as well as pledging their homes. So they had done a lot to put a personal investment in the project. Um, and then their commitment and passion for the business was, you know, extremely high. And um, that was a part of the reason the SBA and the banks thought, you know what, here, we're going to we're going to make this loan. Um, and then they put in they worked seven days a week for many, many years and they paid off all those loans. Um, and through that time period, they continued to leverage their expertise and then not be afraid to invest in outside support. So they paid for an accountant to do their financial reporting. They had an attorney beside, beside them. Um, often I, I see small business owners that don't want to spend for those categories because um, I know budgets can be tight and those can be expensive resources, but those are in the eyes of a bank are really important and and paid off and and they ended up being additions and counselors to this business uh, team and then finally where are they now uh, they've successfully sold that off and they're happily retired and so they were able to create their dream live it and now they can just enjoy the fruits of their labor and and their grandchildren so it was a fun fun to be a partner with them in that that's great and jeff final final story there you go. All right. Well, I'm going to tell the story about a uh, about a local company that is um, its story is still developing, but it's uh, it's had a lot of um, a lot of interesting little steps along the way that are good for entrepreneurs to understand. So it's a company called Kaleidoscope Group, and what they do is is um, they are a mobile first uh, application to uh, help college student uh, uh, help high school students apply for college scholarships that are private branded things. Think Taco Bell Foundation, Ford Foundation, things of that sort. They're giving away college scholarships. There are many dollars that are out there to be given away for high school kids, and a lot of those dollars don't get given away because kids don't know how to connect to those particular scholarships. So this is a, a mobile application to do it. So the company was founded by uh, a, uh, a local entrepreneur who used to work for another company in, this, in, in the space called uh, Scholarship America. And that particular company, um, has historically had the lion's share of this kind of business, but very much was a paper oriented kind of company and wasn't a mobile related kind of company. And this is the observation that, um, uh, that uh, Greg Dean, the founder, uh, had, had identified. And so he left the company, he sat out his one year of his non-compete so that because he couldn't go to work or create a new company uh, you know, at that point, and, uh, but used that year to kind of plan his idea of where he wanted to go. Um, and so when he started the business um, um, in, his, um, in his apartment, um, shortly afterwards, he got connected to the folks with uh, Generator out of uh, Milwaukee, of course, have operations here, and he joined their accelerator program. Uh, and um, uh, at the launch event, when the, everybody is you know, pitching their particular idea, that was the evening I met him. And from there, uh, we quickly made an introduction uh, for him to the Gopher Angels group. Um, who within about 60 days uh, invested the first round of money into the company. The Gopher Angels Group invested the second round of money into the company. And uh, at the end of February, um, uh, talk about getting in under the wire before uh, everything uh, broke loose in, in terms of COVID-19, the company closed on a $3 million round of venture capital mm. financing 
rally ventures. And so now they are well funded going into this uh, mess that we have now. Uh, but you can, you can imagine that, of course, um, their business is one that should be able to work, uh, be able to work fine because uh, they don't have to be face to face with any of their uh, their customers. They are managing the money for the foundations, and they are encouraging kids to apply for those programs online through their mobile application. So um, it, it is um, it, it's. It's a business that kind of started at the end of the, the Great Recession um, and uh, now uh, you know, has, uh, has the legs to be able to move forward and build uh, you know, significant jobs and opportunity for Minnesota uh, to be uh, um, at the forefront of that particular space. So it's kind of cool. Thank you so much. So uh, we're at, at the end of our time. Uh, I wanted to highlight that a week from today at 3 p.m., um, is a, 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 a more specific uh, um, program specifically about equity and the capitalization table or how, or how equity is divided among the owners of a company. Um, and then for future programs with Minnesota Venture Builders, which is uh, the, the variety of seminars and education programs related to Launch Minnesota, um, I have the website up here and we will also do a follow-up email to the people that have registered